Now we're back for our third panel today, Trade and Economics Roundtable, China and the Sustainable Global Economy, Where to Now? Let's warmly welcome our chair for today's third roundtable, Mr. Victor Gao, Senior Vice President of the Center for China and Globalization. Thank you very much, ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. Let's start with our roundtable. We will talk about trade and economic roundtable, China and the sustainable global economy. Where to now? Uh, I think this morning's session is really exhilarating. Uh, the fact that CCG brought Ambassador Burns of the United States and Mr. Xie of China together on the same table and in front of all of us to share their views, talk about the importance of cooperation between China, the United States, and EU, and many other countries in dealing with climate change impact is truly very, very impressive. It means that so long as China and the United States talk with each other, we need to be more optimistic. And the other round table is also very successful. And now we talk about where is the beef, uh, how the economic development can be promoted, how the uh, sustainability of the global economic development can really be achieved despite of all the difficulties. We have about 75 minutes altogether for this afternoon. There are 10 distinguished participants. We will more or less just follow this alphabetical order and each panelist will speak for about five or uh, three or four minutes and then we may have more time for robust, dynamic discussions and exchanges of views. Um, allow me to give the floor first to His Excellency uh, George Burry, Ambassador of Switzerland to China, because I understand he has some other engagements to uh, go to uh, after his uh, presentation. And without further ado, let us give the Ambassador from Switzerland to China a warm welcome and let's listen to what he has to say about how to promote the sustainable development in the global economy and what China can contribute to that. Thank you very much. Uh, Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for giving me the floor. Um, this is a very uh, challenging topic that you're addressing, and I think uh, we have to mentioned that um, when it comes to this uh, bilateral cooperation on economy, the ties of uh, Switzerland and China have been proven to very, be very fruitful and they come from a long time ago, uh, diplomatic relations in, uh, in 1950. Um, we have had a strong focus on economy uh, for uh, quite a long time. Um, in 1980, uh, for example, Switzerland was uh, one of the first countries to have a joint venture with a Chinese entity, and um, then also among the Westerners we were first to have uh, an FDA in 2013, and uh, very good trade figures up to 2020. Uh, two, and I also hope uh, for the future, uh, on, after, uh, this year and uh, onwards. Um, Switzerland has a strong stance in defending its interests and values. Um, interests that may be trade, values that may be uh, other issues, and uh, we believe in an open dialogue as a tool, and we offer China cooperation on trade issues, on bilateral issues, on multilateral issues. These uh, dialogues, of course, have been um, negatively affected due to limited travel, um, but we hope that they will now fully uh, resume and gain further substance. And uh, we have started with uh, political dialogue, with uh, human rights dialogue, uh, labor dialogue in summer uh, 23, and uh, we have marked the trail. On political issues, we will always strive to remain a credible advocate for multilateralism, peace, stability, and hum uh, respect for human rights, universal rights, free trade. And uh, the challenges that lay ahead of us are uh, reactivating other forms of people-to-people -people cooperation. 
the coming years will bring landmark events. Uh, we will have uh, anniversaries of our, uh, of our trade agreements and um, we will have uh, opportunity to further address the challenges that you mentioned. And I think uh, in that, on that page, I should uh, foremost mention that there are new prospects, new topics that have moved from more the periphery of our bilateral relation to almost the center of our bilateral relations. Um, one of these examples is our cooperation in the field of uh, finance, exchanges in the field of finance, uh, which today have a rather uh, high profile, while as at the beginning of uh, diplomatic relations, they were not a uh, topic yet. And another topic is the one that you uh, mentioned in the title, and that is uh, sustain sustainability. We had a quite uh, wide program on project cooperation and what has remained is the sustainability field. So also this a topic which has moved from the periphery, which has come up, moved to the periphery, to the center. And I think these are um, two nice examples that uh, diplomatic relations evolve, that diplomatic relations are a mirror picture of the times and that um, with uh, diplomatic measures, we can actually help achieve the goals that you mentioned in your introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, allow me to mention that Switzerland was the first country I ever visited outside of China back in 1982. And uh, I was in uh, Kyiv, uh, Ukraine in July. And uh, combining all these decades of time, if I have a personal wish, I hope Switzerland will always remain a neutral country. Uh, neutrality of Switzerland will definitely be a global public good for all the countries in the world. Eventually, it's a decision for Switzerland themselves to decide, but I think uh, neutrality of Switzerland in the turbulent world will be a great asset. And the fact that Switzerland and China signed the first free trade zone between China and any European country is truly remarkable. And both China and Switzerland really are strong advocate of free trade, tearing down barriers between, uh, against trade of all kinds across national boundary. So thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. And uh, uh, you decide the appropriate time where you need to uh, leave for your other important um, engagement. Now, I would like to give the floor next to uh, Mr. Zhang Wenchai, who is the Vice uh, President of China Exim Bank. Uh, he also mentioned that he has another engagement later, so uh, he will uh, be uh, speaking a little bit out of the order, out of the alphabetic order. Uh, Mr. Zhang, Governor Zhang, is very well experienced uh, dealing with MOF, uh, Minister of Finance, World Bank, ADB, etc., and used to serve with Agricultural Bank of China. I think uh, Exim Bank in China actually played a very important role in facilitating Chinese exports and imports uh, throughout the world. And wherever you go, you see some presence of China Exim Bank. And I think uh, it has established a very extensive working relationship with many countries in the world. And I truly believe that for Exim Bank and countries like Switzerland, for example, emphasis on financial cooperation uh, will be the key. So I give the floor to uh, Mr. Zhang Wenzai, the Vice President of China Exim Bank. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. It gives me a great pleasure to attend uh, today's forum. Our world has entered a new stage of turbulence and transformation. As we speak, uh, growing stabilizing factors and uncertainties are posing huge challenges to global uh, sustainable development. The first are challenges facing global economy and trade uh, recovery. At the present, the world economy is characterized by the high inflation, interest rate, and debt levels. Where geopolitical disruption and protectionism and unilateral at least, uh, again, uh, back, a global recovery remains sluggish and great. 
Uh, second, industrial and supply chains are confronted with uh, stability challenges. Uh, you know, face of COVID-19 pandemic and the geopolitical conflicts, global industrial and the supply chains uh, have shown signs of uh, localization, regionalization, and uh, fragmentation. Third, developing financing face challenges. UNCTAD's re report uh, published in July this year shows that uh, annual investment gap for achieving the sustainable development goals by 2030 has increased from $2.5 trillion in 2015 to more than $4 trillion. The fourth challenges involve debt sustainability. Mr. Gao mentioned about that, you know, uh, challenges right, we are facing, you know, not only for the trade, but I should also say that we are facing a lot of debt issues, right, uh, in, in a different part of the world. And, uh, risk, you know, uh, some developing countries, especially low and middle income countries, uh, uh, are facing great debt vulnerability and a soaring default risk in a backdrop of capital outflows, currency devaluation, and BOT imbalance. At the BRICS Africa outreach and BRICS Plus dialogue in late August, President Xi Jinping pointed out that the delivery of the most sustainable developing goals remain low, slow, which is the cause for the concern. The development and the development, uh, global development endeavors face formidable challenges. In face of the severe crisis and challenges, uh, international communities, including the financial institutions like us, should play a more active role in promoting global development. First, we should stick to the multilateralism and reform the global governance system. President Xi Jinping proposed to build a global community of a shared future and put forward the Barrow Road Initiative, um, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, and the Global uh, Civilization Initiative, providing humanity with more Chinese input and insight to help solve the challenges in the global sustainable development. We should improve the global governance system and enhance representation and the voice of the developing country. Recently, the BRICS uh, cooperation mechanism has been expanded, and the African Union has formally joined the G20, injecting a new vitality into the global governance, where the G20 summit has responded to call for adjusting the voting rights of the you know, World Bank and the IMF. Second, we should uphold the openness and cooperation by promoting the liberalization and the facilitation of trade and investment in the face of the current situation, we should reduce barriers in you know, trade and investment and create a sound economic trade environment, which is open, fair, and good for the development. We should oppose the politicization and the pan-securitization of economic cooperation. Joint efforts should be made to create an open, fair, and development-friendly economic and trade environment. China steadily expands the institutional opening arm and is working toward joining the CP, CPTPP and the DEPA, what we call DEPA, and uh, enhance and enhance the regional, which will enhance the regional economic integration and industrial supply chains resilience. Third, we should adopt a package of measures to fill in the development financing gap. We should have uh, inter international financial institutions, policy banks, and development banks play a big role in this regard, and at the same time mobilize more social and private sector capitals. Fourth, we should enhance the capacity the policy coordination and minimize the adverse impact of the monetary policies of major economies on the developing countries. We need to adopt appropriate macroeconomic policies and. Uh, and strengthen international regulatory cooperation in areas such as cross-border capital flows and economic stability. We should establish and improve the financial safety net and work together to address risk and challenges. Fifth, we should take an objective standpoint and promote the debt treatment of relevant countries. On the one hand, with the fundamental principle of joint actions and equitable burden sharing, we should strive to reform and enhance the existing international roles for the debt treatment. We are encouraging greater involvement from the multilateral institutions and private creditors in the debt treatment. On the one hand, by taking, by taking both debt treatment and economic development into consideration, we should focus on the implementing project and improve the people's livelihoods and contribute to strengthening the economic and industrial foundation. This will require us to promote transfer of the advanced technology, knowledge, and ideas. We must enhance the internal driving force 
for development of relevant uh, countries, thus in ensuring the sustainability of that with sustainable development. Over the year, China Exim Bank has been actively supporting global sustainable development. O going forward, uh, we will, as always, work with each side, to strengthen uh, communications, deepen cooperations, and uh, contribute more to realizing the global development featuring more inclusive and more resilient. With that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Governor Zhang. Uh, we know for sure that Exim Bank of China has served as a lubricant, an accelerator, and a facilitator in China's trade with many countries in the world. China by now is already the largest trading partner with more than 140 countries. That's the latest number. And I think uh, the role played by China's Exim Bank is crucial in making this happening over the past decades. Thank you very much, Mr. Zhang. And uh, now I give the floor to uh, Mr. Stephen Allen Barnett, who is Senior Resident Representative in China of the International Monetary Fund. We know for sure that IMF and the World Bank are the important pillars of the international financial order established uh, in the ashes of the Second World War. And China is a very important participant in IMF and in the World Bank activities. And I still remember very clearly the important role played by the World Bank in particular and by IMF in terms of the regulatory reform, financial reform in China over the decades. So, uh, Mr. Barnett, you have the floor, please. Well, uh, thank you very much, and my heartfelt thanks to the Center for China and Globalization for inviting me to this roundtable. You know, the organizers posed a, a great list of questions, and I was really tempted to try to address them all, and I can speak really fast. But maybe rather than saying a little bit about each one, let me say a bit more about one, and I think my job is made easier because uh, my friend at the Exim Bank, Zhang Wenzai, already covered a lot of the points <laughs> I was going to say. So I want to focus on trade, and in particular, how can we again make trade an engine of growth? And the bottom line is the global economy could certainly use another engine of growth right now. now our most recent forecasts, which were published in July, had global growth falling from 3.4% last year to 3% this year. 3% global growth is too low. It's well below average, for the two decades before the pandemic, global growth averaged 3.8%, to give some perspective. It comes on top of a global pandemic that sharply reduced activity. So rather than making up for this lost activity, we're actually falling further behind. You know, we estimate by the end of next year, the world economy would have lost around 4.5% of output compared to what we thought before the pandemic. And if I don't have enough good news here, third and finally is that even over the medium term, we forecast global growth to be only 3%. This is our lowest medium term forecast in decades. So let me get to trade. We know that trade integration has been a key ingredient of strong growth for many decades. We also know, however, that globalization's benefits, for which there are many, have not been shared equally across countries or people. That's why at the IMF and our discussions with governments, we emphasize that building better domestic policies must also be at the core of efforts to ensure trade and technology work for all. But another key takeaway is that fragmentation is not the answer to ensuring trade works for all. You know, fragmentation could prove quite costly. Our research shows in some scenarios, trade fragmentation could cost as much as 7% of global GDP. Rather than fragmentation, we need trade to again become an engine of growth. This starts with rolling back damaging trade restrictions and distortionary subsidies imposed in recent years. And then it continues with positive steps, such as update the rules to better address long-standing issues that have been at the heart of recent trade tensions like subsidies, tariffs, and technology transfer practices and to reach new market opening agreements in modern areas of the global economy that have the potential to boost growth and promote inclusive trade, such as digitalization, services, 
and investment. To conclude, now the global economy is facing considerable challenges today. The solution to those challenges lies not in fragmentation, but rather in renewing the spirit of international cooperation, including in trade. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. I think uh, uh, Mr. Barnett mentioned the importance of international cooperation in the world of today. I think that's absolutely important. This is exactly what I believe China stands for. China does not want to have a fragmented world. China wants to promote a unified world, a world where countries and people can really freely trade with each other. And China believes that trade is a liberating force. It really enables everyone to participate. It's an equalizer in a sense. Countries in the more uh, less developed uh, global south can participate if, for example, they have access to connectivity projects. That's why I believe China is so eager to promote the connectivity projects under the BRI uh, framework. And allow me also to mention, you know for this, probably better than I do, that the special drawing rights, SDI, SDR, I, in uh, uh, the IMF uh, framework already has Rimming B as a constituent part. And I will believe in the coming decades or so, uh, the weighting of the Rimming B will further increase. So we can wait for another five years or 10 years to see how much will be the increase of the Rimming B in the special drawing rights uh, basket. So thank you very much, and we truly want to promote this international cooperation across national boundaries, and I personally firmly oppose the fragmentation of the global market or international trade or setting up opposing blocks to get at each other's jugular, for example, which doesn't make any sense as far as greater efficiency and the efficacy of international trade is concerned. Now, allow me to give the floor to uh, Mr. Chao Yuanzheng, who is the chief economist, chief economist at Bank of China. Uh, I've known Mr. Chao for many decades. He's well known in China. Um, he advised uh, many uh, countries or companies uh, throughout his decades of experience, and he's well known in China as an uh, authority in analyzing Chinese economies. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chao. You have the floor, please. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, since time is limited and uh, many participants are Chinese, so the organizer of the meeting suggests me to use Chinese in order to save time as, as well as make myself better to understand. So China economy and uh, the world sustainable economy actually has become more and more prominent, especially in 2018. We can uh, see that uh, there are some disruptions of the uh, economy. We can see uh, the sloppage as well as uh, the decrease of the growth and uh, Ukraine crisis took, pla took place. And we could see the uh, intertwining of uh, the uh, spiking uh, inflation plus the uh, sluggish growth of the world economy. So right now we can see these two issues become uh, more prominent and become core issues. And the major reason is coming from the decrease of the productivity of the labor forces in the world. In the beginning of this century, be the developed countries or developed countries, we can see the slowdown, even the drop of the productivity of the labor. The core reason is that the uh, we yet to embrace the new round of the uh, technical revolutions, but uh, the um, old generation of the technologies has been somehow step by step phased out. So right now, this is uh, exacerbated by a lot of other conflicts. And uh, from the technical progress perspective, there are a lot of debates and uh, discussions from three aspects mainly. The first one is that whether or not we have new technology like AI technology application. And the second is uh, like uh, the um, application in a larger scale of the new technologies. Third one is the low carbon economy. We compared the uh, different scenarios of uh, the uh, new technologies and currently we think the low carbon economy will be the most prominent scenario. And that is also the um, 
uh, reason why we select climate change as uh, the primary topic for this morning session discussion. And China's uh, economy right now is uh, under the downward pressure, especially due to the slowdown of the retail market, uh, of the real estate market. And uh, we need a new momentum in the demand side to generate the sustainable growth of the economy. And then our attention being spared to low carbon economy instead of uh, the other alternatives. So we have estimated. So based on the uh, uh, Paris Agreement within two degree control, China has to invest 10 billion USD at least. Uh, within 1.5 degrees Celsius, then China has to con invest 18.3 billion. In the next um, 18 years, we have to invest uh, 3 trillion to 5 trillion continuously for at least uh, um, 30 years to push forward the Chinese economic development at the same time, generate the momentum of the world. Because China right now is the, the country, single country with the, the uh, most complete matrix of uh, these sectors in the industry, and then the market is very huge. So a lot of um, capacity are on the top uh, in the world, which means that the uh, low carbon or the decarbonization technologies of the world has to be somehow highlighted in China and prioritized in China and commercialized in China. So it is quite promising. Only uh, can it be commercialized, uh, could it say, be uh, potentially um, utilizable technologies. And we can to, to collect the technologies application of uh, PV and uh, wind. And uh, right now, this uh, batch, bunch of the technologies are among the top in the world. I've been visiting the biggest solar power company in China, which is uh, in a very remote area, Qinghai province and uh, the state grid investment company. The land area of a single company is uh, way bigger than the land area of Singapore. And also, it can switch the power with uh, uh, the power uh, from the solar to the, uh, to the hydropower seamlessly. And there is no single facility involving coal burning. It is 100 percent uh, clean. At the same time, in terms of the use of the clean energies, there are a lot of cases. For example, the NEV or the uh, hybrid EV, it actually changed the total way of uh, the uh, production of the vehicles. And the uh, NEV has become, especially the vehicles right now, has become the commonly owned property of uh, the residents in here in China. So when we uh, disseminate the usage of the NEV, it will contribute a lot for the low carbon development and also decarbonization. So in that end, that would be the new realm of uh, uh, trials of cooperation and the market right now is open to the world. Hopefully the investors of the world can join and uh, enter this uh, market and contribute to the decarbonization of uh, the human being society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tao. Uh, allow me to make several points about Bank of China. First, it's not the central bank of China. Lots of people abroad thought Bank of China is the central bank, like Bank of England, Bank of Japan, etc. Et it is not. Secondly, Bank of China was founded predating the founding of the People's Republic, so it has a very illustrious uh, history. Thirdly, for many, many years, up to about the middle of the 1980s, Bank of China was the exclusive bank in China dealing with foreign exchange. So it played a very important role in helping China, Chinese government entities, institutions, individuals in uh, exchanging renminbi into many other uh, currencies. Uh, now it is still the preeminent and dominant uh, bank in terms of foreign exchange dealings in China. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Tao, uh, and I think uh, we sh could uh, learn more about China and globalization and the important role of finance uh, provided by institutions like Bank of China. Uh, now I give the floor to Mr. Karim uh, Daho, who is the Deputy Director and Head of the China Unit OECD Global Relations and Cooperation Directory. 
Um, OECD is a very important uh, international organization. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Taho, whether he thinks there will be a time when OECD may eventually admit China as a member, or how long that process will be. Um, uh, among many things that Mr. Daho impressed me, the fact that he went to Paris Institute of Political Science, as well as La Sorbonne University, two of the best universities in France, are very impressive. So, I give the floor to Mr. Daho, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, uh, Gao. Uh, let me first thank uh, Henry and uh, the China, the Center for China and Globalization for the, the kind invitation. Uh, I won't stay too long, spend too long, too much time on the, the, the question about uh, uh, when China can join the OECD. I can only stress that for the moment there are a number of uh, developing countries that are uh, in the pipe queuing for uh, becoming potentially new members. We have several countries that are uh, on an accession track, including uh, Brazil and uh, Peru at the, at the moment, and Argentina. And Indonesia has just requested membership. So uh, China, for the moment, is a key partner. We are getting ever uh, closer on a range of uh, issues, uh, like Indonesia, like Brazil, like, like India. Uh, China is a key partner of the organization for uh, uh, a good 15 years. So uh, in that capacity, we are working very closely uh, with China on a very wide range of uh, public policies, including uh, economic policy and trade which are the two topics of this, uh, of this discussion. Um, trade has been uh, uh, addressed by a few uh, speakers. If there's an opportunity to engage in a second round of uh, comments, I'm very happy to touch on it. We have uh, uh, intense cooperation with China on trade-related issues, but since um, we have fresh data that regard uh, the Chinese economy, we've just released a few days ago our interim uh, economic outlook, I will focus my uh, intervention on uh, the economy. So as mentioned, uh, just a few days ago, uh, we issued our new forecast for uh, growth this year and next uh, year. Uh, we have uh, figures uh, which for China are almost on par, uh, slightly uh, lower, but almost on par with what we were uh, forecasting at the end of uh, last year. 5.1% uh, uh, of uh, growth this year in 2023 and 4.6 uh, next year. It's, uh, it's very, very fair. It's, uh, these are very good, uh, uh, including against the, the picture, the, the landscape of sluggish uh, global growth. These are good numbers. But there are a few, uh, uh, a few issues that are hinging on the, the growth prospects, at least in the short term. And I will, uh, uh, and I will uh, uh, highlight them uh, very uh, briefly before uh, uh, touching on some of the uh, reforms of, of the uh, ways forward that uh, China could consider uh, implementing with a view to uh, improving uh, the, the structural uh, uh, strength of its, uh, of its economy. So unlike in 2020, I think we need to, uh, to stop on this uh, when China's economic uh, recovery uh, uh, exhibited a clear uh, V-shape. Uh, what happened in uh, the first quarter when uh, China reopened of, the, uh, of 2023 was not so uh, clear-cut. In fact, it was, uh, this recovery was a bit weaker than expected. And in the second trimester, uh, the picture was not that much better. The, the figures were even, uh, even weaker. Uh, this was largely uh, uh, down to the ongoing uh, uh, restructuring and deleveraging of the property sector, which, by the way, is, uh, is, a good, uh, is, is, is tackled, according to us, in a good manner by the Chinese government. Uh, too much of an accommodating or expansioning uh, uh, budgetary or uh, monetary policy would not necessarily uh, uh, produce uh, uh, the greatest effects, and I can uh, uh, get back to this issue uh, a little bit uh, later. Uh, there was another uh, factor uh, that was uh, uh, that explains these uh, uh, relatively disappointing figures. At, at least at the beginning of the, the year, it was the, slug, the sluggish uh, consumption uh, growth. And last but not least, there's the challenging picture of. Uh, the local uh, government uh, debts, which again explain why perhaps 
uh, budgetary uh, expansionism, uh, but there are other reasons uh, why it might not be as uh, uh, warranted as uh, uh, in past, uh, uh, as when China had to, to enact policies to recover from past crises. Um, nevertheless, uh, the second uh, half of the uh, year seems to uh, hint at an improvement, uh, and uh, it seems that the economy may have already uh, bottomed out with indicators, these are important indicators for consumption and for uh, industrial uh, output picking up again uh, over the summer. Uh, but as I mentioned, there, are, there still are a few uh, uh, long-term challenges, and I would uh, uh, like to uh, uh, highlight uh, uh, three ways uh, that would help uh, China uh, perhaps to return to more dynamic growth while also ensuring that it contributes to sustainable global economy. These three factors are uh, productivity growth, uh, the shift towards a more consumption-based uh, uh, growth uh, model, and last but not least, uh, the transition towards a net zero uh, economy. So let me touch on uh, productivity growth first. This is not a challenge that uh, uh, hits only China. Uh, we are working on this at the OECD for a good decade. Uh, we focused our 2015 uh, uh, ministerial council meeting, annual ministerial council meeting on uh, uh, sluggish productivity. It's affecting a lot of OECD countries, but uh, China has been particularly hit by a decrease of productivity since the last financial crisis, since 2008. Before 2008, uh, the growth of total uh, factor productivity was a uh, two-digit growth and it was uh, nearing 20%. Since, uh, after the crisis, since 2008, it's 5% on average. Uh, this reflects uh, an issue of resource allocation for the Chinese economy uh, at large. This is the main uh, factor that lies under uh, productivity uh, performance, and there are a number of issues that, uh, uh, that can improve this resource allocation. One important issue, according to us, that we uh, highlight uh, across the economic surveys that we carry out on China every two years is the need to ensure competitive neutrality. Competitive uh, neutrality uh, between state-owned enterprises and not only foreign investors but also domestic private investors. Uh, Two-thirds of the Chinese uh, GDP is still generated by the private sector. The private sector has higher productivity than the public sector, uh, higher returns on investment, and ensuring good competitive neutrality uh, between SOEs and their private competitors is important in this uh, regard. Um, second important point, uh, uh, a shift, the necessity to shift towards uh, a model which is mm, less led by uh, investment, more by uh, domestic consumption. Um, although they are concerned about uh, its pace, uh, household consumption has been the main driver of China's recovery so far this year. So it seems uh, we are on a good trend. For the recovery uh, to be sustainable, uh, more nevertheless must be done to reduce the, the need for people to save for old age and health. So uh, every possible effort at uh, strengthening, at widening uh, social security safety nets uh, can only uh, support uh, this uh, uh, shift towards uh, a more uh, consumption-based uh, 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 growth uh, model, which should uh, improve uh, the prospects, the long-term prospects of the Chinese economy. Third and last important point, uh, the net zero uh, transition. Uh, to achieve uh, its uh, dual uh, carbon target, peaking emissions by 2030 and uh, achieving net zero uh, by 2060, uh, the pace and scale of uh, China's decarbonization will have to be the largest of all the large economies. Uh, it's a very considerable effort that is required. It will uh, uh, need a, a truly ambitious domestic reform agenda and also uh, the need to double down on international cooperation and dialogue regarding uh, climate issues. Uh, the OECD looks forward uh, in this regard to strengthening its cooperation with China on climate and the net zero transition, including in the context of our new forum, uh, our new inclusive for forum on carbon uh, mitigation approach, 
approaches. It's a, it's a flagship OECD initiative. In the context of this forum, we aim to uh, measure uh, the impact of a range of uh, policies, not only pricing policies, not only, only carbon pricing, but uh, renewables deplo deployment, emission caps, emission targets, uh, as well as environmental uh, regulation, measure the impact of, of this series of policies on uh, emissions mitigation. China has a lot to demonstrate in this uh, area. It is making tremendous efforts on all these issues. So uh, we very much encourage uh, uh, China to join the forum, which already gathers more than 60 countries. China has actively uh, participated to the, the first meetings of the, of the forum. Uh, we encourage China to become a, a full uh, member of the inclusive forum on carbon mitigation uh, approaches. So, um, in the interest of time, I would have liked to touch on trade, but perhaps we will have a second uh, opportunity to do it. I will stop here. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Daho. Uh, I personally do hope one day China will be a full member of OECD, because uh, uh, China is actually a typical example of how a country can successfully promote economic cooperation and development over the past 44 years. And if you believe in Elon Musk, by the middle of this century, the overall size of the Chinese economy may double that of the United States. So if China by 2050 is still not a full member of OECD, I'm afraid it will be too late. So I personally want to urge OECD and Chinese government entities to start the dialogue and negotiation for a full membership for China in OECD. Now I'll give the floor to Ms. or Madam Ma Xiaoping, who is Senior Vice President, HSBC uh, in China. Thank you very much, Ms. Ma. Thank you, Mr. President. And I enjoy a lot of the excellent discussion this morning. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my speech will be in Chinese. So you may like to put on your uh, area. So we, know, we see that uh, the, the global economy is in a downturn. The major uh, in, um, interest increase uh, cycle is near an end. In terms of China, the, the policy makers are strengthening the structural reform aiming at uh, middle and long term. At the same time, using uh, macroeconomic to, to provide a safety net uh, for the society. Uh, so in the short term, 5% uh, growth seems uh, not hard, but uh, in the long term, uh, sustainable development still requires tremendous efforts. Global uh, against the global geographic uh, ge uh, geopolitical uh, risks, all countries are making adjustments to their trade and economic activities. Uh, global supply chains are thus becoming more complex. Uh, Governor Chao mentioned this. We should uh, note that uh, China is still at the center of global industrial chains, but we should uh, pay attention to the new uh, challenges posed by the rearrangement of uh, global supply chains. There are, however, a few highlights. For example, Asian economy and the uh, Middle East economies in transition. We are seeing uh, more frequent um, ties. Uh, Asia and uh, Middle East economic corridor it might be a new highlight of uh, and trade and economic growth in going forward. At uh, present, we are seeing uh, profound changes in domestic, both domestically and internationally. So the Chinese economy is uh, more resilient. So we need to take advantage of that to increase China's um, competitiveness. We are seeing that after COVID-19, regulators have uh, stepped up communications with international financial institutions, including HSBC, 
trying to resolve the pain points that uh, we faced. So we are on our way for a high quality growth thanks to uh, China's uh, financial opening. Uh, HSBC has been the largest financial uh, institution globally operating in China. So we have uh, always tried to become the bridge between China, financial bridge between, between China and uh, the world. We are seeing sp uh, more uh, developments in the f following three aspects. The first is dovetailing with uh, international rules and uh, regulations, and second is increased access to for uh, f uh, foreign inst financial institutions and uh, more pr provisions of uh, financial production products. And the third is uh, a e equal attention given to to efficiency and uh, security. So we will continue to support China's opening up policies, contribute our share to green transition, RMB inter internationalization, and the Belt and Road Initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a lot to talk about HSBC and its role in financing in the Greater China area in particular, but we do not have enough time. Hopefully there will be another chance to talk about it. Uh, we need to finish everything within uh, 75 minutes, so we will push through. So now I give the floor to uh, Ms. or Madam uh, Beat Trunkma, who is the deep UNDP resident representative for China. I think uh, Madam Trunkma probably knows Asia better than many of us here. She is very much involved in China, in Mongolia, in Indonesia, in Sri Lanka, in Cambodia, etc. And uh, so we can really benefit from her very extensive knowledge base and experience, hands-on experience in development. And we know for sure that UNDP, while every constituent organization within the UN um, uh, umbrella is important, UNDP is particularly important. And if there is no United Nations resident office, normally UNDP resident office doubles up as the chief rep of the United Nations system in that particular country. So, uh, I give you the floor. I give you the floor, Mr. Trangman. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, uh, and I, indeed, I have a, a soft spot uh, for Asia. Uh, of course, since uh, UN reform, that uh, double-headed role has uh, separated. So I represent the UN development uh, program here in China, and our resident coordinator, UN resident coordinator, represents the uh, UN uh, development uh, uh, systems. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to engage uh, this afternoon uh, uh, with you all, and uh, I thought I could uh, focus my remarks uh, on uh, uh, discussing China's role in um, international development cooperation. Now, um, wearing my uh, development hat, I wanted to actually start by pointing out that China's remarkable economic growth has in fact also brought about very significant uh, development results, both uh, domestically and uh, globally. For example, the world, w uh, the world uh, without China lifting 770 million people out of poverty since the opening up and uh, reform area would have not met the Millennium Development Goal uh, number one to half extreme poverty uh, five years ahead of uh, the targeted uh, deadline at the time, uh, 2015. And I think China's uh, contributions uh, in or achievements in this area continue to contribute also to the sustainable development uh, uh, goal number one, zero poverty. Now at the same time as, as China uh, has uh, uh, grown its economy to become the second largest in the world, it has of course also become the biggest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in absolute terms. 
and that was obviously a, a, a topic of hot uh, um, and very informative discussions uh, I saw it, um, this morning. So, so indeed, I think given the size of uh, uh, its economy, what happens in China indeed impacts uh, the rest of the world. And, I, and this is, I think, precisely why China's sustained and sustainable growth is critical in advancing today's global agendas, including the 2030 uh, agenda, the SDGs, and the Paris uh, Climate Agreement. Now, in addition, um, China's active participation in and contribution to international uh, development cooperation also plays an important role in advancing uh, global uh, sustainable development outcomes. And I think China has made um, important commitments uh, uh, in this regard. It has highlighted in its uh, 2021 white paper on international uh, on development cooperation, uh, the SDGs and the 2030 agenda as uh, guiding frameworks for its development cooperation, emphasizing also the role of multilateralism. It has enhanced its uh, global de development and South-South cooperation fund, adding one billion uh, US dollars to the already uh, three billion uh, dollars that were in the pool, and it has put forward uh, the 1.5 uh, billion RMB, RMB, uh, Kunming Biodiversity Fund, uh, during its uh, COP15 presidency and it has pledged also importantly to support the green economy and green energy uh, transformation in developing countries and stopping financing of uh, coal power plants overseas uh, during the uh, 2021 uh, General Assembly. Now I think to, to further accelerate um, these trends and to ensure that China's international uh, development cooperation, including through uh, China-led member states initiatives such as the Global Development Initiative, generate, can generate optimum uh, impact. I wanted to make uh, uh, two brief suggestions for consideration. One is on the modalities of uh, uh, cooperation. And I think there we have an opportunity to scale up demand-driven South-South uh, and uh, trilateral cooperation as a mechanism that can leverage comparative advantage of players while also providing context-specific solutions to countries' unique sustainable development uh, challenges. UNDP is already working with China in this area, providing our decade-long uh, experience in development cooperation to ensure that its engagements can draw on international best practice, norms, standards, as well as our uh, global platforms to connect the demand from our global southern constituencies uh, into the supply of knowledge and financing from China, and we look forward to further expanding this uh, collaboration. My second point is on the areas of uh, cooperation, and again, it's a point that was touched upon um, this morning, because I believe in addition to climate mitigation and uh, uh, the green energy transformation, it is very important uh, to also focus on climate adaptation in the uh, of for China's development cooperation to focus on climate adaptation in the countries most vulnerable to climate change. The adaptation gap report of uh, 2022 shows that the international uh, adaptation financing flows to developing countries are actually five to ten times below estimated uh, needs. And UND, as UNDP, we work with multiple countries uh, uh, already to advance their national adaptation uh, plans, so we stand ready to offer our platforms uh, for exchange and collaboration. Let me close uh, by saying, and we're of course just coming off the uh, SDG summit uh, um, in New York also, 
with only 15% of the sustainable development goals on track at uh, midpoint and many regressing and the worrisome uh, uh, signal there is that it is particularly the climate and environment goals that are uh, regressing. Uh, I think the 2030 <clears throat> agenda is hanging on by a threat. So I think decisive collective uh, action is our only hope uh, to rescue the global goals and China can and must play uh, a key role in that regard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Trankman. Uh, we know for sure that uh, UNDP and the World Bank and other international organizations within the UN uh, umbrella have really contributed a lot to China's economic reform over the decades. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you and uh, thank UNDP for the historically very important role it has played for China's modernization, reform, and globalization. So in this connection, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ms. Elitsa Bileva, Chief Economist for China, Mongolia, and Korea of the World Bank. Uh, she is very experienced, and when we talk about the World Bank, for people like me who really uh, started to witness and participate in China's reforms starting from the early 1980s, the World Bank is truly a rain maker in the 1980s, not only providing funding, but also, more importantly, providing knowledge base, know-how, and access to the most advanced international standards. So, uh, Ms. Mileva, we want to listen to what you have to say about this very important topic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Gao, for the very kind uh, introduction. Um, being almost the last speaker on the, on the panel, this was bound to happen, so I my, my, the arguments I would like to propose today are very similar to the ones by uh, Mr. Cao from uh, the Bank of China, but I hope that I will provide additional evidence and some more arguments to support his uh, position. Um, so I, I chose a topic to talk about China's climate action and how that will make China a positive force for um, a sustainable global economy. So beyond the fact that if China achieves its very ambitious uh, carbon neutrality goal by 2060, um, it will be the biggest single contribution by any country to, to uh, global climate goals. But beyond this direct impact on, on GHD emissions, China can play an important global role in, in, in two other dimensions. One is uh, a strategic, its strategic importance um, to, to lead uh, global climate action. And this was dem demonstrated back in 2020 when China committed at the uh, UN General Assembly to achieve its twin 2030 2060 carbon goals. That pledge was followed in the next few months by a string of pledges by other countries. And within a few months after September, almost half or uh, more than 40 percent, sorry, so countries that are responsible for more than 40 percent of global GHG emissions made pledges to uh, net zero. So China is strategically important in, in leading uh, global coordination uh, on uh, climate change. Now, in addition to that, of course, China being a very large uh, and important economy, it, it has a role to play through trade and investment uh, links. On the import side, China is so large that if it uh, shifts its import basket from goods that are, uh, that are um, from uh, high carbon uh, sectors, including fossil fuels, to products that are low carbon in nature, of course it has, China will affect the relative prices of uh, high carbon versus low carbon uh, goods globally. And this will reduce the abatement costs for all global, uh, countries in the world, not just China. On the export side, China is already a leader in terms of um, green export competitiveness. It, Back in 2019, it ranked fifth on the Green Competitiveness Index. It was actually higher than Japan and Korea. Now, having a large domestic market and strong manufacturing capabilities helps. Many low carbon technologies are shown to, to have increasing returns to scale, for example, uh, wind and battery storage. Uh, and the increasing returns are not just to production, but also innovation and operation. And so when China scales up low carbon technologies, 
prices will fall globally, again, reducing the abatement cost for, for all countries. In addition, China is also rapidly building innovation capacity, and this point was already made by uh, Mr. Cao. So um, back in 2019, China accounted already for almost a quarter of the global R&D only in the energy sector. Growth in, in climate change-related patents has also accelerated in uh, recent decades, particularly in low-carbon ICT in buildings in uh, uh, renewable uh, power. However, China still has, um, uh, has, uh, has scope to, uh, to improve or opportunities to grow. This is in the area of high-value, low-carbon inventions that are registered in, in two or more uh, patent offices. So in this area, China's performance is a bit more moderate. It lags some of the uh, advanced countries like uh, Germany and Japan. But if China is able to shift from quantity to the quality of uh, research and patents, then its opportunities to contribute to global climate action via trade and investment again will grow. And then finally, on the investment side, just one example, China already is a leader in, in foreign direct investment in, in low carbon sectors such as the production of electric vehicles, for example. We've seen recent data on uh, FDI into si Southeast Asia, so that's another channel um, for China to have a global impact. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for your important speech. Uh, allow me to take this opportunity to thank the World Bank once again for the outstanding role it has played in the course of China's reform. And uh, uh, China is now a very important member of the World Bank. And I believe in the coming decades, China will play a more important role as far as its participation in the World Bank and IMF and other international financial institutions are concerned. Now, uh, allow me to give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Graham Fletcher, Ambassador of Australia to China. Ambassador Fletcher is well known in China. He has served uh, three assignments in China, including right now, as the Ambassador of Australia to China. I actually took a particular interest in one of his previous assignments as Deputy Council General in Nomia of New Caledonia. I asked the ambassador whether he served in that capacity full-time or part-time. He said it's full-time. Holy cow, I want to have that position working in the paradise in the world. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. You have the floor. Thank you. Um, New Caledonia is a nice place to visit. Um, over the past decade, globalization has faced a number of challenges. Uh, countries have placed a growing premium on resilience and security in their supply chains and pursued interventionist policies. Businesses have increasingly been keen to de-risk, with more companies factoring geopolitical considerations into their business decisions. And global and regional shocks such as COVID-19 and Russia's aggression in Ukraine have added stress to the trading system. In this environment, it has become popular to proclaim the end of globalization, but the story is not so simple. Last week's WTO World Trade Report showed that claims of deglobalization had been exaggerated, and recently there have been clear signs of re-globalization WTO report showed that trade flows both within and between blocks remained resilient despite recent challenges. So globalisation is not in long-term retreat, but it has changed and it has become more regional. For example, China is trading more with ASEAN and the US is trading more with Mexico and Canada. Other factors such as increased government, company and consumer interest on sustainability, climate and human rights have also driven changes. Put simply, globalisation is not in irreversible decline, but its complexion is changing. But why should we persist with globalisation at all? The answer is simple. International trade and investment are central to prosperity and to security. Without open trade, we would be poorer, we would be less resilient, we would be prone to more conflicts and we would be more unequal. Globalisation and economic integration are important channels by which we promote peace. That's not to say that we should be blind to the potential vulnerabilities arising from globalisation, but we should seek to manage those risks through the rules-based trading system 
in a manner that is balanced and careful. We should resist the impulse to turn away from the rules-based trading system on which our collective prosperity depends, because it's this system that has underpinned the historical success of our countries in attracting investment and supporting trade flows. All countries, including China, have a key role to play in strengthening the system. It's yet to be seen if China will play a, a significant role in driving forward globalization, or if policies adopted here and elsewhere will lead to further deglobalization or fragmentation of trade into blocks. China's entry into the WTO has been hailed as a key moment in the history of globalization. China benefited significantly from the transparent and predictable access to markets that WTO membership offered, and access to China's market also greatly benefited other members and encouraged investment into China. As the world's largest exporter and one of the world's major economies, the policies that China takes in coming years will go some way to determining the future of globalization. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. <laughs> Allow me to make a, a personal note. I think uh, Australia has China as its largest, uh, most important trading partner and has the United States as its staunch blood treaty partner. So my personal belief is that if Australia has to be forced to pick and choose between China and the United States, it will be a nightmare. The best position for Australia is to play in good offices between China and the United States to bring the two big countries closer together rather than having to pick and choose between China and the United States. But that's a decision for the Australians to decide. Now, allow me to give the floor to our last, not the least, uh, speaker, His Excellency André Haspel, the ambassador of the Netherlands to China. We know for sure that the Netherlands has always been very well known, respected in China. More recently, Netherlands is becoming more well known in China because of this uh, fascinating role played by ASML, which is still an ongoing process. So let's keep our eyes open as to what exactly will happen to ASML and what will be the prospect of China Netherlands relations. Your Excellency, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And since in the previous panel ASML was also mentioned, I I'd just like to mention, first of all, and the speaker said that as well, that we should not focus on the smaller details of our cooperation, but focus and keep our eye on uh, the larger picture. And the larger picture is that uh, you are uh, the sec of you, we are the, the second biggest trading partner from Europe in China, and you are our biggest trading partner in the Netherlands. So I would first of all say that we keep that in mind. Uh, and when it comes to uh, ASML, uh, I think we've always been very open uh, and we continue to be very open. We have almost on a weekly uh, basis, we have discussions with the, the Chinese counterpart. Part. Uh, and then, but I will keep that for the next time if you allow me, Mr. Chair. Um, um, I think strategic dependencies uh, and the risks of doing business should, uh, should be applicable to every country, including China, uh, to take into account your strategic dependencies and your legitimate trade interests. So, so on that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I hope that I've briefly addressed the issue of ASML. But I've already noticed that in my first two weeks of being in China, I arrived two weeks ago, ASML is really a topic that we'll be uh, happy to discuss much more often. Now, I'm not going to focus uh, on semiconductors in my uh, contribution. I'm going to focus on, uh, on the first question, which has to do with the, uh, the global challenges that we are facing and climate change. And um, uh, we all know that we need to, uh, to deliver results to make sure that the Paris Agreement can be fully implemented and also to show that the world is not backtracking on its commitment to climate issues due to the economic uh, crisis caused by, by COVID. And although there is always much more room for ambition, um, climate change is indeed a field where China has much to offer. And we very much welcome the, uh, the ambitions laid out by President Xi during his speech at the UNGA back in 2021, uh, in which he announced that China will strive to become carbon neutral by 2060, and to peak its CO2 emissions by 2030. That being said, global challenges can, also, can only be solved at the global level. 
and that requires global partnerships. That does not only go for tackling climate change, but also for uh, subjects like energy security, food security, health care, uh, including elderly care, uh, as well as sustainability and biodiversity. So collaboration between countries on these topics are essential. And that's exactly why we, the Netherlands, are currently working on with China. To give you a few uh, concrete examples, Mr. Chairman, the Chinese Minister of Science, Technology and Innovation will be visiting the Netherlands next week. And during his visit, he and his Dutch counterparts will lay the groundwork for strengthening our co cooperation on science, uh, on technology and innovation in many different areas, uh, including uh, uh, such uh, topics as vertical farming, sustainable urban development, water management and health care, including elderly care. Furthermore, the global challenge of health, and in particular elderly care, is important for our countries to collab collaborate on as well. Both China and the Netherlands face significant demographic challenges due to rapidly aging population. And elderly people uh, in themselves are not a problem, of course, but the question is how to ensure that these citizens can spend their life comfortably and in good health. And that is exactly why our countries are closely working together on, for example, medical technologies on combating dementia. And next month, the Dutch Minister of Health will be hosting a high-level ministerial level meeting called Defeating Dementia, including the participation of the Chinese National Health Commission. Finally, on the broader context, the Dutch government developed a global health strategy which focused to strengthen the resilience of the health sector uh, infrastructure on pandemic pre prevention, etc., etc., and also for that topic, the Chinese delegation will be visiting the Netherlands soon. Mr. Chairman, these are just a few examples of our bilateral, bilateral cooperation that I believe are contributing to finding solutions for the global challenges that we are facing. And we might have our differences from time to time um, that can cause friction, but I truly believe that only through joint efforts we can overcome our global challenges. And I very much look forward to us, the Netherlands and China, working together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, the Ambassador. I think uh, the Chinese people and the Dutch people really share a lot of things in common. Both the Chinese people and the Dutch people dare to overcome all the challenges. Uh, and this is very impressive if you look at the Dutch people and what they have accomplished. It's the same case in China, and I do agree with you that China-Netherland trade is much larger than uh, whatever that China deals with uh, as small. But allow me to also mention one point in my personal capacity. China by today is the only country in the world which can manufacture the most sophisticated smartphone all by itself. It does not need any imports, semiconductors or otherwise, from abroad. Now this was not something China chose to do, to start with. Lots of people abroad say, why should China do this? This is very disruptive of the supply chain involving semiconductors. China was left with no other choice. China was forced to go independent, and now it is self-reliant. And uh, Huawei company, is the only company in the world which can manufacture a very sophisticated smartphone in-house. This is truly impressive. What impressed me the most is the ability to build such a miniaturized uh, antenna allowing the smartphone to communicate directly on ground with a satellite 35,000 kilometers above ground. This was truly an engineering miracle. Now, I do believe China and Netherlands trade and bilateral relations will flourish in the future. But allow me to, again, quote in my personal capacity what was said by a very important president of a country. And uh, if uh, Ambassador Burns were here, as he was this morning, I would say the same thing. The president said, it is very dangerous to be an enemy of the United States, full stop. Then he goes on to say, it is more dangerous to be a friend of the United States. What he means, you know, you need to be philosophical as to how to figure out. But I think uh, uh, ASML, I hope, will be continuing doing good, brisk business with China by overcoming the maximum pressure from another country. 
I think the pressure against China try to deny China's access to semiconductor results in China becoming completely independent in semiconductor chips. This is truly amazing. China used to spend more than 200 billion US dollars importing chips from the United States and quite a few other countries and regions. Now you are talking about China completely independent and China makes smartphone more sophisticated in my view and in the judgment of many uh, experts in the industry more sophisticated than the latest version of iPhone. This is a revolutionary moment and I truly believe this will have tremendous profound impact on companies like ASML. I think Anna is waving to us saying our time is uh, uh, up so allow me and I hope you will join me in thanking all the important participants, the ambassadors, otherwise in our round table. Thank you.